This is the You Can Learn Chinese podcast, part of the Seneca Network from Sup China. For everyone who's trying to learn Chinese or reaching for the next level, you came to the right place. I'm your host, Jared Turner, longtime resident of China, co-founder of the Mandarin Companion Graded Reader Series, and my wife and I, we laugh at about how competitive we are, but I laugh harder. My co-host is John Pazden, co-founder of Mandarin Companion, founder of All Set Learning, the Chinese Grammar Wiki, Sinosplice.com, and he just finished a book about recency bias and swears it's the best thing he's ever read. If you're into music, this episode is for you. John and I talk about how music can help you learn Chinese. Interview is with Bohan Phoenix, a Chinese American hip hop artist straddling two cultures. If you've not yet heard of him, then don't miss this one. All this and more. Let's get to it. Hey guys, this is Jared Turner coming at you from Utah in the United States. Hey everybody, I'm John Pazden. I am located in Shanghai, China. How's everybody doing? All right, Johnny. Before we kick into things today, we have a couple of reviews. Uh, you want to lead us off with that? No problem. So this first one is from Yeah, I like Toy Box、uh, via Apple Podcasts, and this person says, "Between work, grad school, and raising a toddler, I, like many others, are playing the I don't have time to learn any new Chinese card. But with my collection of Mandarin Companion books, I can maintain my current level. And listening to this podcast keeps me engaged with learning the language. Every episode contains great information on how to approach learning." How to stay engaged with learning, and a motivating episode with someone who has made significant strides in the journey of learning Chinese. You can add another lifelong learner to team extensive reading. Thank you, J and J. Thank you. That's a great review. All right, thanks. And I assume she means John and Jared, and not like Johnson and Johnson. So we'll take it. All right, what do you got, Jared? Okay, we have a review from Tigger Queen two two five five. She says, "Y'all help me impress my Chinese teacher." I'm a senior in high school learning Chinese, and this podcast has been the ace up my sleeve. My teacher was practically blown away by my pronunciation of tones, all thanks to pronunciation tips from this podcast. Really, the credit should go to the host of the pod. They also helped me level up my Chinese with their awesome graded readers, and with which I'm still at breakthrough level. I can't wait to move a level up, though. I'm super psyched every time I see a new episode、it、has been released. I love Mr. Jared's intros and the jokes he adds in every episode. And they have yet to fail to make me laugh. Ha ha! Great. Okay, she does have a question here, John.、Uh, she's specifically asking about pronunciation.、Uh, she says her tones are pretty good with single syllables, and I can hear the tones decently too. But she says that when she's listening to recordings or other things, she hardly registers the tones at all, and she relies entirely on other parts of pronunciation and the context.、Uh, so, what can she do to improve your listening as far as tones are concerned, and if applicable? How to transition naturally hearing tones. So、uh, it's kind of funny she brings up this question because,、uh, I, and this review came in I think before the last episode had dropped. But、uh, you should go listen to the last episode we released. It directly addresses this issue entirely. Yeah, and just to put your mind at ease a little bit, you're totally in a normal situation here.、Um, this is part of the you know developing fluency, so don't worry about it. And listen to that other podcast. That's right, and that's episode number eighty-one. Tones answers to the questions you didn't know to ask. So go check that out. But she did know to ask it. You're right. Good on you. Okay, so today's podcast we have a theme. It goes throughout the podcast, including the interview today.、Um, it's a special interview, and today's theme is music. So we're talking about、um, how learning Mandarin songs may or may not be good for learning Chinese. So、um, let's get it out of the way in the beginning.、Um, is learning Mandarin songs good for learning Chinese? Well,、um, I'm going to give my answer real quick. And just like many things on this podcast, the answer I have to say is it's complicated and it kind of depends. So we have plenty of stuff to explore here. Yeah, you definitely. I, I've got some experience with this as well as my family. So this is going to be a fun topic to talk about. All right. So well, let me address one thing before we get into、um, some of the other issues. And if you just started learning Chinese and you know you're working on your tones, you might still be wondering what is up with songs and tones. And I think this is good news. For the most part, you really don't have to worry about tones when it comes to singing Chinese. So don't try to learn tones from listening to music, and don't try to get the tones right when you sing. Don't worry about it.、Uh, amen with that. I, I was concerned about this. I do sing. 
and you know I had learned songs, and I'm like, how does this all handled? But you're right, it was over a process of time. I just kind of figured that out, and after talking to some Chinese friends, it was like, oh yeah, yeah, you just you, you you essentially you can kind of focus on pinyin, if you will, not worry about tones. Yeah, so Jared and I are going to share some uh, personal experiences with uh, learning songs and how it affected our Chinese. But let me just say a few a uh, few things in the beginning. Uh, one is like. If you need a break from tones, then maybe that's a good reason to uh, to study some Chinese songs. Or if you live in China because you're surrounded by the music, that's another good reason to uh, to learn some Chinese songs. Or if you want to learn a little somewhat literary vocabulary without actually reading a bunch of literature in Chinese, then you can get some of that in songs. And you know, every song is a little different, right? Or uh, maybe if you don't want to get too obsessed about learning every new word because you want to enjoy the music. Or or, or you just enjoy music. <laughs> you want to learn to sing. Ah, yeah. oh, well, I took it. Ha-ha. But yeah, if you just, you like music, you like singing it, and you now you want to expand your repertoire, you know, you could, hey, start learning some Chinese songs. Or if you like karaoke. And you want to do it in Chinese, you know that's going to impress people. Or if you have to do karaoke. So, All right, so I just had a whole bunch of stuff. Jared, do you have any stories you want to tell? We can we can kind of trade off for a little while. You you, you go. Are there any songs that had a, a special impact on your Chinese learning? All right. Yeah, yeah actually, I'll, I'll share this one. It's for my wife, Heather. Uh, so when she started uh, learning Chinese, it was before we'd moved to China, and she had gotten some... I, videos, I believe, of like Chinese nursery songs, that type of stuff. And that's how she first learned to count to 10 in Chinese. Uh, it, it's kind of funny. Uh, there's a song that's uh, really popular. It goes, Yi, er, san, si, wu, liu, qi, wo, de, peng, yo, zai, na, li. And so that was her first exposure <laughs> to Chinese. And she's never forgot that. Um, and so it, that that was a, a oh yeah that's adorable it is adorable and it's it's a catchy little song and Chinese people love it when you know that song too because <laughs> everyone knows it okay well let, let me give a sort of cutesy one when I when I first moved to China you know I had been studying Chinese for a while uh, less than two years but you know I had I had some Chinese under my belt but you know I still couldn't understand any songs I had no idea what these songs were about I, I could guess and maybe make out a few words here and there. But then there was this one song where I could like understand the whole, the whole chorus, and I'm not gonna sing it. But it was like "How Xiang, How Xiang, How Xiang He Ni Zai Qi," and I was like, "That is so simple." And so I didn't really want to like that song, but I just kept hearing it and understanding it, and it made me like study it, and I learned some stuff from that song. So uh, I think we all have kind of a a special song. It might not be Er San, but um, because it was simple enough for you at that level, like you, it was like your intro to Chinese music song, right? Absolutely, and and I think that's one of the nice things about music is that uh, it, it's more than just the words. There's something about it that can just you know implant itself into your mind in, in ways that you just don't forget. I, I think we all will have music in our own native language, which will do that to us. And you know, for example, I I think about. Uh, I still know all the words to uh, Ice Ice Baby, you know, Vanilla Ice. <laughs> you know, I, I, I can rap that one out. But, you know, there's going to be stuff like that. It just speaks to your soul, does it? Oh, absolutely. All right, stop. Let's collaborate and listen. Anyway, but uh, we're all going to have some element of music where it can do that to us. Okay, so what about you personally, Jared? What songs have impacted uh, your learning experience? Well, you know, when I first moved to China... John, it was in January of 2010, and I was a total Chinese noob at that stage, but it was about a month before the Chinese New Year. And uh, there's that very, very popular song, you know, Gong Chi Gong Chi Gong Chi. And I didn't know anything else, but. But that, I mean, you're hearing that song everywhere, going to the supermarkets and just all around town. And so I think that I learned that one very early on. 
Uh, so ni you, I'm like, okay, that really helped out. And then of course I learned how to say gongshi, which is what like, you know, congratulations. <laughs> Wasn't very helpful, but didn't forget that one. All right. Nice. Well, I, um, my next one is, is more related to, uh, like grammar. Cause you know, I have kind of a thing for grammar. I, I, I enjoy a little Chinese grammar. Yeah. Yeah. You do. And, um, there's this, yeah, there's this one song that had some vocabulary and some patterns that that really kind of stuck with me because you know we're we're all into extensive reading and a big part of that is to just see things over and over again and in extensive reading it's different contexts but with with songs it's often just you know the same chorus over and over again but anyway that repetition is useful and so there's this song about 对面的女孩看过来 看过来看过来 and just these patterns. I'm not going to get into grammar, but it's not the way that we would say it in English. It's not that easy to translate. And um, just understanding how the Chinese works and then hearing it over and over again, um, I just found that really useful. Yeah, I totally agree with that. And, and that's that's something, as I think about it, too, that's helped me. It's just you learn, you know, this, this is something that you really pick up from reading, from listening, you know, or whatever, just you're practicing your language, you're getting exposure to it, you start to see uh, phrases where you know all the characters, but now you see it in a way that, oh, this is how it can be used. Oh, this is how, you know, one application of that phrase. And it just kind of starts to expand your repertoire. And music can be, you know, one of those excellent ways to get that exposure. And then I have one other example, which I guess it kind of follows in, in the same category as the last one, although it's a little harder, I guess. Um, and that one, in English, it's called The Moon Represents My Heart. I, I guess it's sometimes translated that way, and it's a, it's, it's a weird translation. Ah, yes. And, and that's kind of the point. Like in Chinese, the word dai, dai biao. Yue liang dai biao yeah, what is the word dai biao is used kind of differently in Chinese than represent in English. And, and so you have to kind of understand the song in Chinese to yeah, appreciate yeah. it. And this is also one of those songs that when I really studied it, and I really like understood it um then i actually found it moving and that and that's one of the few songs at least back then that actually had an effect on me in that way like the lyrics themselves You know, John, the first time I was exposed to this song was from your blog on Sino Splice. Nice. And uh, and I, 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 I too, I, I loved this song once I had heard it. And I learned to play it on guitar and sing it. Uh, so I was going to bring this up. So glad you did. Because, yeah, this song, it's very beautiful. Um, and it's just, it can, I did. I think like you, it it's struck a, a chord in my heart, you know. And it's just very beautiful. Mm-hmm. There's a reason it's a classic because it's it's. Right, and I'd like to give one other example, um, which is not my example. It's it's from one of my my clients at All Set Learning, and this is this is a an advanced learner, and he did something which was really interesting that I don't think any of my other clients have ever done. Like they can study anything, right? And the one thing he wanted to study was Chinese songs. So he had like this big long list. He had this he had this playlist hmm. of like. Pretty complex songs. Like these are not any of the ones that I mentioned before. These are like ones that are kind of hard to understand. And so all he wanted to do was just talk about the songs. Like not just what exactly do the lyrics mean, but also like what do you think of this song? How does it make you feel? What what, what uh, you know associations do you have with you know these lyrics and that kind of thing? And so it was a very advanced way to study. Um, but for him, he found it super rewarding, and it, it really helped to make a connection with the Chinese culture. I, I got to ask, John, what was his uh, motivation or his reasons for doing that or approaching it that way? I think he was just genuinely interested in, in the music. He really liked these songs. He, he had listened to them many times, so he, he basically knew the words, and I think it bothered him that he didn't totally understand what every song was about. And, um, you know, sometimes lyrics have a lot of cultural background. Like you can't just understand the words and know what they're talking about. And um, so I think that's the kind of thing that he liked to talk about with the teachers. 
Sounds like a great example of like following your interests. Pretty cool story. Yeah, but that's not something you can do right off the bat, right? In the beginning, you have to be satisfied with finding that that rare gem of a song that you like and that you can actually understand. Well, there's another genre of songs which I think is worthy mentioning, and these are going to be more like holiday songs. So I, I think uh, specifically, which comes to my mind uh, about this, would be uh, Christmas songs. Uh, and we have done this. I, I, I'll have, have to say that uh, my wife has worked with uh, some of the local the kids who are learning Chinese in our area and she's done singing groups and done some Christmas programs and things like that where uh, the kids were learning to sing Christmas songs in Chinese nice did you use the Santa's Play stuff for that too I, I actually I don't recall but I will say that one nice thing about doing this is that you, you're essentially you're having like a translation of a song so in general these are songs that you know you're familiar with and now you're going to be singing these in Chinese and and this is something that uh, it can be really helpful you're kind of like oh okay uh, this is how it would be this is how you would say it and something I've noticed John that you know when we have a song like that that's translated uh, it, I, I've there's sometimes where you start to realize oh this doesn't directly translate mm. and in the song it's maybe written a little bit different way it might change the meaning a little bit uh, but it conveys the same idea. And I think that's a wonderful exercise to sometimes get past that uh, mindset that we have early on where, like, I've got to have everything directly translated uh, you know, precisely 100%. Well, speaking of kids learning Chinese songs, um, years ago when I first moved to Shanghai in 2004, I worked for a company that did English education for kindergartners, and I helped with uh, teacher training. But um, one of the things they did was called TPR, so this is not TPRS, which we've talked about before, uh, teaching proficiency through storytelling. This is TPR, which is total physical response. And the idea is you learn songs, you sing them mm -hmm. in the foreign language, and then you, you do these actions as you sing. It's kind of a dance. And so, you know, if, you're, if, you're, if your song is about standing up and sitting down, then you actually do that while you're singing. Um, and so it can be really good for kids. And I see this in China for kids learning English, but I'm curious, Jared, if you've seen uh, American kids learning Chinese doing this kind of thing? Uh, no, I haven't really seen it, but I, I, am I am familiar with that TPR, Total Physical Response, and uh, I've seen, yeah, kids doing it in China, but not so much here. Uh, but it can be helpful. It can be useful. It, maybe not as a, the only way to learn, but uh, definitely you know, for listening and kind of following commands and stuff, that's definitely helpful. All right, the one other one I'd like to mention is Chinese Buddy. It's a YouTube channel. You can go up there and just search Chinese Buddy. Uh, the guy behind it, his name's Timothy. Uh, it's And he creates wonderful, catchy songs for people who are learning Chinese. In fact, there's one specifically that stands out. It's uh, Cho Tofu, Stinky oh, Tofu. Oh, yeah. Uh, that one is super catchy. And you collaborated with him on that one, right, John? Yep. It's related to a Grammar Wiki Grammar Point, and you'll also hear my voice in that song, uh, but not really singing. Okay. You should be grateful for that. Cho Cho Tofu. Yo, yo. Every day I wake up thinking about Cho Tofu. Are you the Bu Yao in that one? I am Bu Yao. Oh, I didn't realize that. <laughs> That's great. But that one's so catchy, all right, that like in my kids dual immersion program, like all the kids know it and they'll like, you know, go around the hallways singing singing Chodofu. Well, probably not all the time, but when they played it first, everyone was like, "Oh yeah, Chodofu ha." It's 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 a really good one. So, uh they they're a little bit, you know, I guess younger uh, focus songs, but they are fun songs for all learners. I uh, definitely would go and check those out. Yeah, that's Chinese Buddy. It's on YouTube. All right, so I got to say, for me, it's really easy to find Chinese songs because I'm in China. But Jared, if you're not in China, if you're in the U.S. or somewhere else, uh, do you have any ideas for how to find Chinese music that you might like? Yeah, that's a really good question. And I think uh, one uh, resource that is available to most people uh, because it's free, is Spotify. Um, on Spotify, you are going to be able to find a lot of Chinese music that's on there, especially like the, the most popular ones. So uh, there's guys like uh, Eason Chan. Uh, he is real popular in China. Uh, anyway, but if you just go search like, you know, China 
top 50 uh, China songs, China pop. It could be, I mean, you can even find classic or folk music. Uh, you can find all sorts of genres on Spotify. And that's going to be a great resource for just finding music. And you can just kind of start listening and browsing. And hey, you know, maybe you find a song that you like, and it's a great place to start. Oh, and I do recommend Chinese folk. There's some really cool songs. Yeah. You, do you have any recommendations? Not off the top of my head. Sorry. What a lot of help you are, John. It's good, though. Find it yourself. But you can go out there, guys. There, uh, There's ChineseForums.com is a place where you can, people are going out there uh, talking about uh, different songs or, or different things that they like. Um, and if I think if you just also have make some friends, some Chinese friends, uh, they are going to be more than willing to introduce music that speaks to them, uh, that they're going to be willing and would want to share with you. And, you know, just think about this, you know, in, in from your perspective, if someone's coming to you, a Chinese friend saying, hey, you know, what's some good English music to listen to? And you're going to like, oh, hey, this is my favorite, you know, my favorite artist. This is my favorite band. And you want to share some of your music with them. Yeah. And I think it should come as no surprise to anyone that like focusing on music, you know, as your main thing, that's not really going <laughs> to be an easy road to mastering Chinese, but it's a great supplement great little you know snack uh, of a thing to learn in your studies and it's definitely not something you should neglect because you know you can make some great discoveries that way and i will say is that you know at times we may have kind of uh you know a r different fluctuations in our levels of motivation for learning the language and you know for some people that could be just one of those catalysts to say hey something you really kind of latch on to and I mention that because there are some people like, hey, are, they really got into learning Chinese because they were interested in like martial arts. Well, martial arts doesn't have a lot to do with the Chinese language, but it was that connection it provided to them, which kind of gave them the impetus and that uh, motivation to continue to really like learn the language to a higher level and to delve deeper. So, you know, if it floats your boat, so to speak, and uh, then, yeah, Go ahead, get into music. It can be a wonderful thing, and I think music is just awesome. I love it. Yeah, so if it's something you haven't tried, definitely give it a shot. And if you ever want to get into Chinese heavy metal, got to check out Tang Dynasty from our very own Kaiser, Kaiser Guo, right? He started that band, the first heavy metal band in China. <laughs> If you want to listen to hit that story, which I highly recommend, it's one of our best stories of all time. It's episode 44, Using Chinese at Work with Kaiser Kuo. 44. Perfect number for a heavy metal episode. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> all right, now it's time for a word from our sponsor. And today our sponsor is... Manor Companion... Easy to read novels in Chinese, aka graded readers. That's right. And today we're talking about Jekyll and Hyde. Uh, this is one of our level two Mandarin Companion graded readers, and we released this one last year, John, in 2021. Ah, uh, yes, 2021. It was a fine year for Jekyll awesome. and Hyde. A vintage year, John. Uh, and this is an adaptation of Robert Louis Stevenson's classic novel. But we had to change this one up a little bit because, you know, in the original Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde book, the plot twist you have find out at the very end is that Dr. Jekyll is Mr. Hyde. Uh, they're, they're the same person. So it's so ubiquitous in culture. Everybody knows that. So we had to actually change up the plot twist in this one. Uh, but don't worry. It's going to blow your mind. Right, John? Yeah, pretty much everyone loves it, except for a couple of people that hated it. And you don't have to worry about them because it's awesome. So you can go out and get it today. It's Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. It's one of our level two Mandarin Companion graded readers using 450 unique characters. Uh, you can find it out on iBooks, Amazon, Kobo, or wherever you get your books. Enjoy the story and thanks for your support. <laughs> Thank you.
All right, now it's time for Rants and Raves. John, what do you have for us today? Do you have a rant or do you have a rave? I have a rave. So um, this is for people in China. Sorry, everyone who's not in China. But um, one thing that I discovered living in China is that China is a really great place to to learn how to play a musical instrument. Um, you know, I wanted to stay on uh, on theme t- today here. Um because, you know, you might hear sometimes, you know, the Chinese educational system, it's all about, you know, rote learning. And you might hear that, you know, the music lessons are often just very concentrated on the classical and, you know, they don't they don't play jazz or whatever. But actually, you can find jazz musicians. You can find all kinds of different types of musicians. You can find awesome musicians in China. And music lessons are not very expensive in China. In fact, it's it's actually a pretty good thing for someone who's learning Chinese to do because you don't really need to have a high level of Chinese to learn music from a Chinese music teacher. So I just wanted to give a a rave. I had a I had a pretty cool piano teacher back in the day and uh, my kids are doing uh, drums and ukulele now just got back from that today. And uh, so I definitely recommend it. Chinese music teachers, you're awesome. Wow. Very, very cool, man. All right, so how about you, Jared? Rant or rave? Okay, John, I have a rave, and uh, also it is connected to today's topic. Now, I got to say, before we pick today's topic, I was going to choose this as a rave. So you could say it could be a little bit of an extension of today. You could say that it was fate, Jared. It might have been fate. fate. There's the new Disney movie that came out, uh, Encanto. If you haven't seen it, it is an excellent show. I highly recommend it. But there's, uh, there is the entire soundtrack is in Chinese. That's right. You can find it in Chinese. Uh, it's actually kind of Taiwanese Mandarin. I think it was released in Taiwan for this version. But you can find it on YouTube or on Spotify. And, I mean, you can even find, like, we don't talk about Bruno. Yep. Uh, except it's like, woman uh, So so anyway, it's, it's, it's pretty good. It's like... You'll find examples of like, you know, what I was talking about earlier, just how like, oh, you might want to translate it this way. Well, you'll find out, hey, it was translated maybe in a different way than you might have expected. But you can pull out some real catchy tunes or something you're really enjoying and loving. And I got to say, my family loves it. And once I found this out, I've been playing it in the house and the kids are kind of like mumbling along to it. They're kind of getting some of the words and they're trying to figure out how to sing the song in Chinese. And it's it's been a lot of fun. Highly recommend it. Encanto in Chinese. Go find it on YouTube or Spotify. Awesome. All right, so after all this music, all this talk about music and songs, we have an interview today related to music, right? That's right, John, because if like you're into hip-hop or rap, then this interview's for you, especially if you're learning Chinese. All right, let's get into it. Oh, uh, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah, boy. Born Phoenix, uh, hey, let me take you overseas, baby, hey, hey, cause I was born overseas, then my mama took me overseas, I made a home overseas, now that I'm back, you remember me, cause I was born overseas. My name is Bohan Phoenix, I am a Chinese-American hip-hop artist, and I was born in China, but I spent about the last half of my life being based out of New York. Now that I'm back, you remember me, cause I was born Overseas, and then my mama took me overseas. Now that I'm back, finally, do it for me and my family. Okay, Bohan, this was a unique interview for us for our podcast. And I usually ask people, why did you start learning Chinese? And I think that's a bit of a moot point. But, like, pull back the curtain for us. What are some of your memories, and, and what was that like when you were in elementary school? I grew up in Yichang, and, you know, we had a highway running behind our building that we probably seen, like, two cars a day, you know, three cars a day. And one of the fun things that me and my friends would do is wait on top of the bridge and try to throw rocks at, like, these cars that come (laughs) by, you know? And I I slept in the same bed as my grandparents for the 11 years until I came to America. You know, we didn't have indoor plumbing. We had an outhouse, and um, inside we had, like, this pot. You literally, if you woke up in the middle of the night and you need to go to the bathroom, you just <laughs> in that pot. And they clean it in the afternoon, them in the morning, and then there's, you know, little squares of farm squares, and, you know, you grow your own vegetables. So I'd walk to school. It takes about like 40 minutes to walk to school, elementary school. And I always tell people about this bathroom part because the bathroom is the giant hole. It's just a giant hole. You go in, it's like an outhouse, and then there's like slits, and you put these like, 
planks over the slits and then you kind of like bend over but if you're not taking the shit, you kind of just like need to pee you kind of just go around to the back and the back is just like this open hole where all this <laughs> is sliding into from the inside the outhouse you know but it smells so bad in there like if people need to pee they just go around to the corner <laughs> and kids used to shove each other into this giant hole of shit. You know, like, it kind of speaks to, like, the place and the time that was, you know, like, hmm. yeah, it was pretty rural, you know, but it was a very simple and very pleasurable life, you know, like, all I knew and everybody, all they knew was in order to do better, you kind of need to get good grades and you kind of need to just excel, you know, and my mom, you know, who was working in Shenzhen at the time, saw that my grades was not going to be the outstanding part of my childhood, you know, life. So she figured out, okay, then the next step, you know, will be America. But yeah, you know, that was, Yichang was very much the opposite of what I experienced in America. But if I didn't have that experience, it'd be very hard to appreciate everything that's happening now. So uh, very uh, humble beginnings. Yeah, it's like humble beginnings, but also just like... Really, really sweet memories, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Maybe you could paint a little more of the picture of kind of like your family situation. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, you know, actually, my mom had met my dad when they were both working in the bank as cashiers. And he had um, sang at a nightclub at nighttime to, like, earn side money. Oh, so and your dad was a singer? Yeah, he was trying to, you know, he had a brother and um, his mom only had money to send one of them to school. So his brother went to medical school and he kind of just like worked on the side and like sang in like this jiuba. It's not even mm -hmm. nightclubs, you know, it's like these little lounges. You know, you've been in China, you've seen those jiuba and they're covering other songs, you know, like yeah. other canto pop songs. So that's how they got together, you know. But, you know, he was too young. He was 23 and he wasn't ready, you know, so he took off. And my mom left me with my grandparents. And each hung where my grandparents were, it's pretty rural. If you stay there, there's really not much opportunities. She uh, ended up working, getting a real estate license, working in Shenzhen. And, you know, Shenzhen in the late 90s, that's a hot spot. You yeah. know, that's where the new money is flowing into. So... You know, she was doing like pretty well. Like she has, she bought like you know funds. She bought like you know a condo, like, and she was sending money back home to 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 each home. But you know, I I can't say I remember feeling much intimacy with her because I don't think I quite understood then like the dynamics. You know, like I just remember being like a kid and being like, oh, my mom is never here. You know, I'm always with my grandparents and my cousins and my uncles and my aunts. But my mom will be there for like Chinese New Year. And that eventually affected how my relationship was with her coming to America and why it made me lean into rap music because I didn't have that comfort at home. You know, mm -hmm. like I had to find it somewhere else. But now in retrospect, after meeting a lot of other Asian immigrants, Chinese immigrants, I realized a lot of them, you know, went through single parent, single mom like situations just like myself, you know. Yeah, it was it was also an incredible, incredible time growing up in the same household as my grandparents and my cousins and my uncles. And it was just like a big family versus had I been living in Shenzhen with my mom, it would have been like very, you know, she's at work, I'm home alone type of vibe, you know. Mm -hmm. So, so are you still connected with your extended family back there in China? Oh, 100%. So basically, after I left in 2003, my grandmother passed in 2004, and my aunt was the closest person in Chengdu to my grandfather. So we didn't feel comfortable for him to be by himself in Yichang, you know, at an old age. So he moved to Chengdu. And once he's in Chengdu, anytime Chinese New Year's or whatever, you know, we're just going there for the holiday. So that became home. Now, from what I understand, it was about 11 years old you moved to the States, Boston, right? Yeah. So, I mean, yeah. tell me about that. I mean, even where was your English at that point? I, I do remember when I was in fourth grade, which is about 1999 or 2000, they started teaching English in China, in Yichang. Okay, so basically my mom, you know, had came in 2000 and was trying to get me to come in 2001. But then 9-11 happened. So I couldn't get my visa until 2003. 
Mm. And funny, I had to like meet my dad for like the second time ever to like have him sign off on me going because the embassy needed my dad's approval to be like, oh yeah, he's gonna come back. You know, mm-hmm. so it's not like uh, he's going to go and become a citizen, which I ended up doing. You know, <laughs> I didn't really speak English. I remember specifically getting like a Boo Boo Gao cassette player and then like getting some tapes. And I remember like when I met my mom, I was going to ask her, how do you do? But I don't think I did that. <laughs> and um, my mom was dating my stepfather at that time. They weren't married yet. And my stepfather is a Swedish American guy, you know, mm-hmm. like Paul Carlson, like. 6'2", like big Swedish guy. And at that time, he was on the tail end of his personal limousine business. He had a couple stretch limousines. He was driving people from like Logan to New York and back and forth, you know. Before mm-hmm. the the Twin Towers crash, that was a pretty lucrative business. So they picked me up in a stretch limousine. And I had never been in a personal car before, you know, if it wasn't for like a taxi or like you know, yeah. like never been yeah. in a limo. So <laughs> I come from each hung and, you know, I cried my entire like plane ride because I'm like leaving my who I theme as my real parents, my, my you know, my grandparents. Mm-hmm. And I'm in this limousine and I'm in the back of the car, like getting car sick and I'm puking in the limousine. And I get home and there's like giant large pizza. And that's the first time ever having cheese or pizza. I <laughs> ate the whole thing. I ate the whole thing. Like, <laughs> I mean, I moved to not just Boston, I moved to Newton. Newton is, you know, a really good suburb, Newton, Massachusetts. So I went from a place where a bottle of Pijo, a beer, is cheaper than a bottle of Coca-Cola because it's imported. Now, like, my stepfather has those 12 packs from Costco, you know, laying around. I'm just like, this is awesome, you know. (laughs) But the only thing that didn't register was I missed my family, you know, and... Mm -hmm. I cried, I cried, I cried, and uh, six months into me being there, my grandmother passed away, and I was like, I, oh, wow. this is horrible. Yeah. So the next summer, my mom was like, look, all right, I'm going to you know, go back to China. If you like it there, then you know, stay there, and we'll figure out a way. And so I went back, and about two weeks in, I was like, uh-uh, uh-uh, nah, <laughs> I, miss my, I miss my own bedroom, I miss, like... <laughs> I miss all of the snacks, you know, all of that, you know. So that was pretty much the immediate reaction. Wow. Culture shock, right? A lot of people who listen and follow this podcast, they sometimes have been to China, right? And so there's that culture shock. But, you know, not as often do people think about, oh, you know, a Chinese person coming to another country, right? But that sounded like it was a really big change for you. It was the opposite, you know, complete opposite. So, Bohan, tell me a little bit what it was like going to school. I can only imagine those challenges, all right? Because you came from China. I guess your English at this point is very little. <laughs> none, <laughs> right? yeah, none. None. Yeah. I mean, what was that like, being in school yeah. with, with all the other kids? And maybe there were some yeah. other Chinese speakers there. I don't know. What was that like? The challenges didn't really present themselves in the actual English learning process. So basically, Newton, Massachusetts had a really high population of Asian people, especially Mm. Chinese people. So they had a really good ESL program, English Second Language. And they had a Chinese translator that came to all my classes with me. Wow. Yeah. I got there at the end of fifth grade, and I had that all the way up until the beginning of seventh grade. And on top of that, my stepfather was American. So being in the household, my mom was working from, you know, 7 to 10 at this medical lab. So I was being taken around by my stepfather, taking me to school when I'm not taking the bus. He figured that, like, it would be good for me to have my own community, like, if I missed China. So he took me to do martial arts in Chinatown. I did that for, like, seven years. And then my mom had me watching movies and cartoons, you know, just to kind of like repeat things back. The language part came pretty fast. And there were other Chinese American kids, but I think I was probably the most Chinese out of all of them. Mm -hmm. You know, like they Mm -hmm. were all pretty much assimilated. And that was my part that I, I was having trouble with because I was also going back to China every year to see my relatives. So I'm growing up, hitting puberty and understanding life in a time where I'm like starting to gravitate who I am and what I am. And most of it was towards American ideals, you know. And then when I go back to China every year, I'd be like, hmm, people don't hold the door for each other. Hmm, people don't. (laughs) All these like these Western ideologies start kicking in and I start having like this inferiority complex about like like how people are in China versus how like American people are. 
Of course, you know, that was before I understood the nuance of everything. But at that time, I remember thinking, hmm, like, I, I like the American side of myself a little more. So that was, like, something that I was trying to figure out. But at the same time, I was too shy to actually assimilate myself. Up until I joined a gospel choir in 10th grade, I ate lunch by myself in an empty classroom, you know? I had a friend that was also Chinese American by lunch bring it to me. And then like my high school had this long hallway that connected all the smaller hallways. So that's where everybody hung out. And if I had a school on one end of the hallway and a class on another end, it'd be too terrifying for me to walk through all the kids and popular kids or whatever. I'd be like so self-conscious. I would leave the school on one end, walk all the way around the fields and then walk wow. back on the other end, you know, like it wasn't anybody was bullying me. Nobody was mean to me. Like people were really nice to me. I just wasn't sure like what kind of identity I wanted to have. And all of this wasn't coherent at the time. This is all looking back in hindsight, mm -hmm. you know, but mm -hmm. I just remember like when I found out about rap music, I just dove straight in because came across it while watching movies to learn English, saw 8 Mile, saw how Eminem was able to use this music to gain confidence and camaraderie in a world that he's completely oscillated by and for how young i was i gravitated to the fact that his dad wasn't there and he had a <laughs> stepfather and my dad wasn't there and my stepfather you know had a loose temper because he was an alcoholic for you know however long and worked in alaskan pipelines and like was a house angels member you know like so like I just gravitated towards all of that. I remember going to school with like a do-rag for a week until like they called my parents. They're like, yo, like Bowen is coming to school with hand-drawn tattoos on himself. I would write like the D12 and all that, you know, like, and this is before I fully was like conversing in like fluent English, you know, so uh -huh. that was really my transition into confidence, Yeah. So what did your mother think about this whole situation? I mean, yeah. Not just about, you know, drawing sure. tattoos and stuff on yourself, yeah. but even about how, I guess, you were lacking that confidence at school. And maybe and, yeah. and how did that transition, how that kind of roll out and your parents interacted with that? You know, me and my mom had an interesting relationship because she wasn't there. So when I came here, she felt like she needed to give me more leniency, she wanted to be not so strict because she didn't feel like she had the right to. She would tell me, you know, obviously school, important, like all this stuff, but she never told me not to explore what I was exploring because I was so young. She probably just thought it was a phase. And she was working so, so much and I was just kind of just doing my thing. And there wasn't that much resistance from either my stepfather or her. I think the resistance came more you know, later on during college and when she's realizing I'm about to graduate college and I'm not really looking for jobs. That's when the urgency kicked in a bit. But at that time, I think she just wanted to be a very loving mother. Thank God, you know, she didn't support it, but neither did she went against it, you know. And then when I um, joined a gospel choir in 10th grade, Basically, I wasn't a good singer, and my choir director, you know, this, like, classically trained jazz saxophonist that teaches chemistry at Harvard, like, really amazing guy. And, you know, he's like, look, I heard you like to rap, but and if every time, you know, we have a school concert, you write a verse about God, about love, you know, you perform it, we'll back you with a band in the choir. Wow. And that's when I performed the first time, you know, with my choir behind me, and my mom in the crowd and parents are very supportive, you know, like suburban parents, you know, yeah. clapping along. But for whatever it's worth, whether their validation was genuine or not, it gave me the confidence that I needed to walk down that hallway finally and start dating girls. And, you know, and I think she saw that and, you know, she was like, all right, I'm going to let him keep doing this thing, you know. It sounds like this is your first step really into to music, right? Creating something, you know, and singing yeah. and performing, right? I mean, but that's the thing. Like, that was my first time performing in 10th grade. But even in, like, 7th grade, 8th grade, I was leaving myself voicemails to with the beats playing in the background. And I'm rapping to about 15 seconds of it. And I remember taking Eminem songs and just keeping the everything, rhythm, syllable, all the same, and just changing the words, you know? Like... 
I, I think the creative part started like even earlier than that, but that was the first time I found a way that made sense for me to actually express it. Yeah. At what point did you decide, I really want to pursue this? I really want to create music? I mean, in high school, I, I got a caddying job and I was doing two loops a day for the entire summer every weekend to get money to buy a laptop and a microphone and a cheap interface. So I would like to think I had that thought at that time in high school. But, you know, I think it was after college and I... I tried to get some jobs with my economic degree, but because I didn't do any internships and every other NYU kid did a million internships and I was just making music or whatever, like I ended up folding jeans at Lucky Brand Jeans for a couple of years and I was just like coming home so tired and like not, don't really have much energy to make music. I just stopped that. And I think that was like 2015, 20, yeah. And that's when I dove, you know, 100% into making it my job. And I didn't make any money until maybe three years after that, you know, so. The plight of the starving musician is, is it's real. <laughs> Yo, but see, that's the thing. It's like, man, thank God I went through all of that. Though. Yeah. You know, it's mm -hmm. the thing. It's like, I record my first song in 2007. I, I released a 15 song tape in my high school in 2008. Me and my boy Ashen released mad songs under the stage name Green Car because neither of us had our citizenship at the <laughs> end of high school. Then I get to college and I release 42 songs my freshman year. Then another 18 songs myself. And, and, but none of those, no one gave a f about. And no, no one cared about my music for so long. But I started so young at such a pure like angle and so blessed to have done that that I developed the patience that a lot of artists today starting out don't have. And this patience and this understanding of this journey and understanding of the people that I've met and the places that I've been and the stuff that I've realized about myself has been the biggest rewarding thing. So if Grammy never comes, if whatever never comes, I am so satisfied. You know, like mm -hmm. the plight of a starving artist and all of that, if you can come out the other side, man, you got a bag full of treasures. What the journey is teaching you, and that's kind of yeah. what I'm hearing from you. Uh, yeah, A hundred percent, a hundred percent. Well, something I, I'm kind of interested to know a little bit about Bohan is a bit of this pull of two different cultures. You talked about, you know, hey, leaving China, coming to America, going back, and then still not being sure where you are. And I sense that even your music has helped kind of bring some of that together. So maybe you could yeah. talk a little bit about some of those challenges that you've had in kind of bridging or bringing these two cultures together. I think pretty much after I got to college, the idea of, you know, I'm just American is pretty much settled. That I have family back home in China that I go and visit every year. And it's pretty much is where I left it. And there were more important things about, like, getting with girls <laughs> and like making music you know like that's the mind of a 21 22 year old right like but it was through like you know everything is imitation like you know walking speaking you fought you copy and for me i was copying my favorite rappers the longest time just trying to impress people with how well i can rap what kind of metaphors i can come up with but it just didn't resonate with anybody. It's like, oh, mm -hmm. all right, here's somebody that's just trying to rap like Eminem or rap like, you know, Lil Wayne, right? Like, then I were like, okay, why do I like these artists? I'm like, okay, because the stories, that's what's gravitating me to them. So I started telling my own stories. I started adding elements of my culture, you know, Chinese and all that. And that's when it's starting to click with listeners. You know, I've, I've been going to open mics since the first week I was in New York. That's when I started to embrace more of the, not that I rejected the Chinese side of me. It just was on the back burner. But at that point, I realized that understanding who I am and embracing where I'm from will help me do what I need to do in America and help me grow as a person in a more meaningful way. And after I started putting that kind of energy and that kind of music out there, the bilingual music, you know, me and my roommate, Jackery, at that time, uh, 2015, we put out a four song kind of funky hip hop EP with me switching back and forth. And then this producer, Howie Lee, in Beijing found my music and was like, yo, we should come out of China and perform. And so that started a chain of reaction of me not just going back to China to see my family, but now I'm also going back 
to perform. And that's when I started diving deep. You know, I had this concept to form for here, to form for home. You know, like, because when I go back to China, I look Chinese, but just by my tattoos, the way I dress, the minute I open my mouth, you can tell I, I spend time overseas, you know, and but I'm in America, like, no matter how well assimilated I am, of course, you know what I'm saying, like, the idea of the perpetual foreigner, you know, for Asians. So that kind of resulted in both the cheerful songs like Jala and also the more introspective songs like Three Days in Chengdu and Product. And that's how I kind of been like figuring out what it all means and concluding it instead of using it as like a point of stress, I kind of use it as a blessing. I mean, damn, like, you know, like I'm sure you look at the fact that you were able to spend that significant amount of time in China as an advantage to who you are as a person, yeah, you know what I'm definitely. saying? So, yeah, so that's kind of how I came to terms with it. And since then, it's just been opened my eyes to you know different type of possibilities both in the creative world and also in just how we can get along as different tribes of people obviously but also as the same tribe and that's kind of like the goal of this music you know is to break down this misunderstanding how do you approach some of your songwriting i'll preface this a little bit like i've listened to a bunch of your music and right away man when i heard like a, a rap song you're rapping in English, and then you switch to Chinese. I'm like, whoa, that was cool. Yeah, that was awesome. But how do you approach that songwriting process and mixing in, you know, the two different languages? When I first started doing it, it was like entire songs in English, but like I'll have maybe like two lines of Chinese in the second verse. But then, like those two lines of Chinese would be where people are coming up, it's like, "Yo, that was dope. What'd you do there?" You know, like <laughs> so it became like you know a uh, half of a verse. Then it became like a whole verse, you know, English and verse and English. Chinese. You know, my writing process became really fun, where I just kind of got to choose how I want to be flamboyant with it, you know. And at that time, you know, I have been submitting my music to blogs forever, and no one gave a f <laughs> until they can write you as bilingual rapper you know i remember mm. like Bandcamp put me on their cover on their page like oriental trap with like bone and phoenix and i leaned heavy into it because again like the attention felt good you know this is before the whole like ada horizon before the whole like asian music empowerment was happening so it was interesting for people to see because chinese is all one syllable every yeah. character is one syllable so sometimes rhythmically you can play with that in different ways. But other times, English, you can drag a word out more mm. than you can drag a Chinese word out. So it became more fun to play with just like musically and sonically. There were points where I was, you know, switching in between the line. But it got to a point where it got me a lot of gigs and recognition and all that. But it became a crutch. And I wasn't able to convey an idea through and through unless you spoke English mm -hmm. and Chinese. You weren't mm -hmm. really, I realized I was exoticizing myself for views, you know, and strayed from the storytelling that I really wanted to do. So I kind of dialed that back eventually. And now I kind of just think about it as like, when is it appropriate for me to say it in what language, you know, instead of just being like, I rap in English and Chinese, like, you know, like, and try to, like, make every song a selling point, you know. Yeah, and, make it yeah. less of a gimmick, I guess, right? Yeah, exactly. What kind of role do you hope to play in being able to kind of bridge these two cultures? I'd say two cultures, I mean, we could even just say general West, right? Yeah, yeah. But, yeah. you know, and there's a lot of sentiment these days that are posing between two different cultures and two countries, really. So what kind of role do you hope to play? So a quick story. So my aunt in Chengdu has never been to America. And, you know, in China, the news you get about America is pretty narrow visioned. You know, like you probably hear about Heianchu, you know, the black people area, which is the poor inner cities. You know, mm -hmm. they see news about all of that. So I remember when I first told my family, oh, yeah, I live in New York. I live in Brooklyn. And she looked it up and said, oh, that's hair and shoe. That's dangerous. You know, like mm -hmm. black people are dangerous. Like, you know, you better be careful, you know. And no matter how I would explain it to her, there wouldn't be any context, you know, because in her mind, the news knows better than Bohan, you know, who doesn't even <laughs> have a job after college. You know, like covered in tattoos, making 
music. And this is before rap became a mainstream thing in China, obviously, you know. So when I brought four of my friends, uh, musician friends from New York to tour China with me, two of them are black. And Ralph is 6'3", 280 pounds, giant afro. He's my <laughs> tattoo artist, you know. like yeah. We all crashed in the living room of my aunt's house. And she wakes up early to walk the dog and she's walking past Ralph and his like shorts and t-shirt passed out, you know. And at the end of the week, she was in love with Ralph and she calls him Raph, you know, and Zaka. <laughs> and word for word afterwards, she's like, wow, black people are so nice, you know. Mm -hmm. So all this misunderstanding, man, it's like, man, I had the misunderstanding growing up in America about China. You know, like I thought like, oh, Chinese people are just more rude, Chinese people just blah, blah, blah. Then I realized, okay, there's four times more the people. If there's four times the people, there's that many more bad players. And on top of that, the whole emphasis on like being nice, like smile at people, holding a door on the Western side, a lot of that is just a way to hide your own uncomfortable feeling. You know, like a lot of it's like, oh, hey, nice to meet you. And then walk away, it's like, oh God, like what is she wearing? You know, like stuff <laughs> like that. Just way more petty personal insecurities that lead into all these niceties. I remember being in China when it's like, you know, hanging out with higher brothers and I go to their friend's house and I'm in there like, hey, what's up? I'm born. Hey, hey, what's up? Hey, what's up? And, they're, and they're like, oh, hey, yeah, yeah. They don't do that ho <laughs> Like they only do that if they deem you as like stranger, you know, if they see you as friendly. They don't do all that. Like, it's, it's a real vibe, you know? So all this misunderstanding that people have until you get to a place, until you got to experience the people there, like, and the role that I hope to play is just communicate as eloquently and as clearly like the compassion that I have to respect myself and respect others and respect what we all do. Like, you know, like take the criticisms when they come, you know, cause I do get criticisms about being Asian and rapping and not from the black audience, from Chinese people and white people, oh, really? you know, like, yeah. Like I remember one time going to perform because they invited me to Oberlin uh, college in Ohio to perform at for their like Chinese student association panel, you know, and I remember we they're like, hey, can we have you know a culture discussion panel before the show? I was like, yeah, sure, and I show up, you know, and it's just all Chinese Americans, not a black person, not a white person. I was like, okay, you know, and we're talking, and they're like, so how do you deal with yourself as like a Chinese rapper? I'm like, what do you even mean by that? They're like, well, how do you, you know, navigate this world, you know, like, because hip hop is for, you know, black people, you know. I was like, listen, my name is Bonhan, your name is Michelle, you know, like, and like, <laughs> we just came from a restaurant that served Japanese sushi and Korean food at the same time. I challenged so much of what their ideal is, what it's like to be Asian American, you know, that they both were fascinated enough to invite me and pay me to perform, but also wanted to be like, so how do you feel about doing this? You know, like for me, everything is intentions. It's like saying like, if black people start doing Shaolin martial arts, it's like, why are you doing that? It's like, oh, cause I appreciate and I love and I want to be a part and I want to learn. So like it was a very eye-opening experience because all the times that I performed at Apollo Theater lining up for hours waiting to get in on the amateur night and then I'm I'm in line with only black and Latino performers, you know, and they're like, What are you doing? I'm like, I'm here to rap, you know, they all are skeptical. And I, until I go on stage and my attitude is right and I come correct, they see that like, oh, oh, he just really likes this. <laughs> and then if you're just a good person on top of try to do the best you can at what you do. It's just easier to navigate all this criticism because, you know, you have a better context of what you're doing. Wow, that's cool. You know, the thing about this entertainment, right? At the end of the day, it's the audience likes it or not. Right. I can see that. It's a little bit less of, hey, what is your race or culture or whatever? It's more of like, yeah. do they like what you're doing? I mean, sometimes people don't know what they like until you do it too, you know? And I have to be honest, like, I never made music to try to get people to like me. You know, I've always made music that I thought would be super dope and interesting, but I definitely there were points where I just stuck with one thing because I realized people liked it. And those were the times that I was the most stagnant creatively, I would say. So 
something I also just kind of interested about, Bohan, is bridging kind of two cultures, two worlds, but also your family, and especially your mom. And I know you mention your mom in a lot of your music, in a lot of your songs. And so what kind of role does she play in your life today, and what kind of influence has she played in writing your music? I think once I realized the only way I could stand out is just by being me, because no one has my story except me. That's when I leaned into inspirations from my life. And more often than not, a lot of things come from my personal relationships. And a lot of that comes from the complexity of me and my mom's relationship. Because up until college, I never told her I loved her. I never kissed her on the face. It was a very cold, but also just distant, you know kind of vibe, you know, like we did everything together, you know, New Year's, Thanksgiving, all that. But it was like, yeah, this is my mom and I'm her son. But there were times when we fight and I'm like, you're not my mom. You were never there. It wasn't until I, it was an acid trip one time and one of my best friends at the time, I was, we were talking about it, tripping out on acid. And I was like, yeah, I just, I don't don't know. Like, he's like, bro, like, I don't know if I could be friends with somebody that don't love their mom. And I started to try to like explain why. And he was like, bro, like think about how hard it was for her to be away from you than it is for you to be there with your grandparents and like thinking about she wasn't there. And then now after she's came to America and not speaking a word of English, transitioning from real estate into biochemistry and learning English and biology on her own at the same time. And he broke it down to me. And with the inhibitions aside, I was like, wow. And since then, me and my mom have became best friends. We talk all the time, joke around all the time. I mean, one of the reasons why I feel so level-headed, I just feel confident because I have such strong rocks in my world, like my friendships and my mom and all that. So, I got to know, how does your family, especially your Chinese family, how do they view your music now? They don't really uh, understand much of what it is but they know i'm making money from it and my cousin who's younger uh late 30s she knows like the vava she knows like the stuff so she knows that like oh bohan puts music with them so he must be doing okay you know i don't know to them they still just think it's something not as stable but a phase maybe (laughs) <laughs> yeah, they don't think it's a phase anymore now after all these tattoos. Yeah. They're over that. <laughs> yeah, they're over that. Well, Bohan, where can people find out more about you, and, and where can they find your music? Pretty much all my handles is Bohan Phoenix or Bohan Phoenix, and then I'm on all the streaming platforms, so whatever is easiest. And for people that want to buy the files, I'm on Bandcamp as well. And I have my first full-length album coming out this year. It's finished, and yeah, excited for that. And will you be doing any touring in the future? I mean, COVID restrictions, if it allows, we'll definitely be doing some shows for sure. Well, that's great. Well, I, hopefully mm-hmm. you'll be coming to a city near whoever's listening. Yeah, so. <laughs> trying to go everywhere. But before we wrap this out, I do want to share uh, sometimes when I am teaching basic stuff to my like English-speaking friends, for example, like, I remember being in China with my bandmates and teaching them how to say shi shi. You know, uh-huh. they would always be like shi shi, and I'd be like, <laughs> say like I was always be like say sh- t- twice, but without the t. And they're like shi shi, and they nails it. They nail it every time. <laughs> and that was one of the ways I was learning English. Actually, was writing the Chinese sonics next to the words to kind of remember it like that. And um, just as a side job for like a few months, I was teaching Chinese on this website called Varsity Tutor. Mm -hmm. It was pretty elementary type of teaching, but I remember teaching this Japanese lady. She had a chauffeur driving her in from Greenwich Village to Union Square. One time I just remember, because, you know, growing up in China, all you get is anti-Japanese sentiments, Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. So I had always wondered if Japanese people felt the same way. And I remember asking her, I said, hey, like, what is making you learn Chinese? And she said, you know, my father's Japanese. He's a very proud Japanese. But he said, in order for us to be the best Japanese that we can be, we need to understand that all of our shit came from China and we need to understand Chinese. And I was like, wow, that's very uh, 
Very interesting. That's a pretty neat story, especially yeah. from Japan. But a lot of right. Japanese do speak Chinese. That that's also right. another interesting thing right. too. All right, Bohan. So we'll be looking for some tour dates in the future. But in the meantime, we'll check out your music there. And I know we can also do some things to support you on your website. And I really hope you get out there making more music. And I'm really happy to hear all these wonderful songs that you've made already. You know, it's wonderful songs. But, you know, it's like stuff I think is really cool. Really appreciate that. Well, thanks for being with us today. All right, Jay. Thank you. You have been listening to the You Can Learn Chinese podcast. Help us spread the word by sharing this with your friends, classmates, teachers, cousins, fighter, athlete, creator, academic, pundit, minister, aficionado, overthinker, wordler, and that one guy named Peter. You can subscribe on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. And please write us a review so we know how we're doing. You can find us on Facebook and at commandercompanion.com. Apologies to John Cena, we just ran out of time. The You Can Learn Chinese podcast is produced by myself, Jared Turner, and our editor is Kaiser Guo at SubChina, and our interview editor is James Harper with Filter Productions. I'd like to thank our guest interview, Bohan Phoenix, and of course, thanks to my co-host, the man, the myth, the legend, John Pazden. See you next time.